universe. Um, and I, I note that um, there's been quite a lot of research on doctoral education itself. Doctoral education itself is a, a field of inquiry. No doubt some people here have published in that area of doctoral education and its changing nature. I think some of you are, are doctoral students here and some people are doctoral uh, supervisors. Um, so that's, I'm really gearing it to that, that audience. It may, there may be some general interest in it as well, but, but that's the main audience I'm, I'm gearing it to. And as we speak, tomorrow in London, there's the, um, the beginning of the sixth international conference on professional doctorates. Just to let you know that these, this is, I think, a biennial conference, and um, it goes for a few days, and it starts tomorrow. So, you know, the is issue of professional doctorates is alive and well, and what I want to do is go through some of the issues that people are facing in, 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 in relation to the pedagogy and the outputs and the location of professional doctorates within the, the research environment in the university. Um, the, at this conference, I'll just read a title of one paper, and I, I couldn't get access to the paper because it hasn't been delivered yet, but I'll come back, to the, come back to it later on. It's called Abductive Research Design, Trusting the Agential Knowing of the Practitioner as Researcher. So that title to me, in a sense, captures the, the, the issue of how you incorporate working knowledge knowledge from work, in work, in professional work, in industry and, and, and so on, um, into a scholarly activity. How do you make it a scholarly activity? And that's really the project of a, an EDD as I see it. Um, for those of you who um, are not that familiar with the, um, if you think of professional doctorates in Australia at least, they really expanded from the 1990s onwards. So from the 1990s, Right through to 2000, there was a huge growth in professional doctorates. There was about one offered in 1990. There were about 272 offered by 2000. The growth hasn't been as, as strong since then, um, but nevertheless, they, they do occupy a place in, in doctoral education. So you had um, a doctor of education, which we're familiar with, and there were previous versions of, of, a, of a doctor of education, EDDs, of course, in the States, motivated by different, for different reasons, but um, we have it in uh, business administration, midwifery, nursing, psychology, surgery, creative arts. These are, I just sort of looked a few up. Visual and performing arts, music, ministry, information technology, science, and in law. And um, so what's the reason for the emergence of, of um, doctoral uh, of, of the professional doctorate as, a, as opposed to the PhD because it's always seen as, as linked, opposed to similar but different to a PhD. So that's the, the starting of it. And um, what my, my um, uh, PowerPoint presentation really just keeps me, they're just, just, they're just lists to keep me on track, so to speak, uh, <clears throat> although my notes are a bit all over the place. Okay, so one, one reason proffered is that universities were responding to a broader, especially government and industry agenda, as the professions and industry started to influence policy, um, government policy in higher education. Um, they were demanding that it be more, that, that education or doctoral level research, education more generally, be relevant to industry. So we're familiar with that, that kind of um, rhetoric. And that really ramped up in the early 90s. So you could say that universities were responding to that by developing professional doctorates, and that, that is no doubt one of the, one of the um, motivations. Although, ironically, what you find is that um, in the establishment of most professional doctorates, industry and the professions were hardly consulted at all, unlike undergraduate courses where they're regularly consulted. Um, and I must confess that I was one of those people. I, I wrote or chaired the EDD at, um, at um, uh, University of Technology, and we didn't consult the industry, you know. What we were relying on is to get a new group of people who were from the profession. And they are the ones that are going to drive the pedagogy and drive the change, rather than let the industry, um, uh, the leaders in industry and, and industry organisations uh, run it. So that, that's one motive. Another is just meeting the demand from industry. The industry and the professions had that demand, okay. Then there was student demand. 
And what was happening in PhDs, and it has been happening a lot, is that um, while the PhD was originally a training ground for, for to, to be a scholar in a university, um, and more and more we were finding that people were older going into, into PhDs, like their average age roughly now is about 33 going into a PhD. Uh, more and more people were not getting jobs in higher education, they were getting jobs elsewhere. Um, in some countries now it's as low as 5% go from a PhD into, into scholarly work. Um, so a research degree is becoming, a, 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 is, is slowly becoming, because of the nature of the students, is becoming um, professional preparation or professional enhancement rather than a purely scholarly piece of work. Excuse my uh, voice, I've had a cold and I'm just getting over it, so I'll need to have a sip every now and again. <coughs> the um, the um, uh, a student demand, so uh, demographic changes, they're older, a, a huge a diversity of students, a lot of international students coming in, a lot of the initial, um, especially in business administration, a lot of the initial recruitment into a Doctor of Business Administration was international students. There are about 50% of international students. In, 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 uh, in Australia at the moment, I think it's about um, a third of students doing doctoral education are international students, something like that. So it really has changed the, 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 the uh, dynamic. So you've got a lot of people working part-time in doctoral education and so on. So there's been a shift to thinking about how to link working knowledge, as what I call working knowledge, um, into, into scholarly work. Uh, <clears throat> the, third, the next one is the recruitment agenda. That, this is a more cynical one. Universities are always looking for new sources of students that can pay money, so on, <clears throat> and um, so it really is a marketing strategy. And the marketing strategy, by and large, worked. Worked certainly worked with international students, um, and it's and it's worked locally. So it, it, there is a um, marketing strategy, and a, a part of this, I'll, I'll come back to that later. So there's the marketing strategy. There's there were some strategic advantages in having professional doctorates, and the other one is simply the impact of the knowledge economy, um, that. The workplace is a site of learning, knowledge and knowledge production. Universities no longer have a monopoly on knowledge and knowledge production. And you know, people for some time have been talking about the co-production of knowledge and the, rec the, the broad recognition that knowledge is produced outside of universities, um, both through research and through researching practice, but also through, through practice itself. So those are the kind of reasons. <coughs> And so what, what was anticipated to be the difference between um, a professional doctorate and what we'd call a PhD? Okay, focus of research, it's clearly on practice and on the profession. So the problem, the source of the problem, if you, if you think of it as problem solving, the research is problem solving, the source of the problem comes from the profession, industry, or your work practice. Um, there's certainly paradigm differences, problems aren't, neatly packaged into disciplinary boundaries. We know that. So you have to use either an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach um, to, to your work. And that poses all sorts of real issues and real um, uh, dilemmas for people who have been trained, especially people who have been trained in a disciplinary context. And it poses dilemmas for supervisors too, who are used to, who have perhaps got their PhDs in a, in a, um, a disciplinary context and then had to think about how do you make things, how do you actually make things transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary? And so that's a, an issue and we can talk about that some more. Um, there was a, um, there was scope for innovative and different research approaches. I don't think that's been fully realized, but there was certainly a hope that that would be the case. And I can talk more about that later, but um, you know, basically it's, um, it's about, uh, uh, you know, the kinds of the kinds of research that you'd expect, would, you know, action research. I know action research is done before anyway, but you'd expect things like action research and portfolios and exhibitions, um, creative projects of various kinds. You know, and you do get that 
to a certain extent, but not in every in, in every area. Um, you know, autobiographical approaches. You know, how does how does autobiography fit within a scholarly community and so on? Um, the another difference is cohort entry. So um, typically. Um, there was an aspiration to have cohorts of people coming in and working together. So and that was picking up on the, on the notion of the new knowledge worker working in teams uh, and so on, even though you know, the, pers the person getting, you know, obviously a qualification is attached to an individual, but, uh, there, but the idea behind a cohort is to perhaps to work on a common problem or to share problems or to support each other and so on. So that's, that's in some ways responding to one of the industry needs, and that is to work in a team. Um, so there's much more structure in a, in a professional doctorate compared to the old, an old-fashioned PhD. Um, old-fashioned PhD is autonomous scholars working, you know, it's the apprentice supervisor model and so on. Um, so there's more structure now and now, uh, so, you know, there might be formal coursework, uh, there's certainly uh, stages of candidature, all sorts of requirements. There might be um, a statement of graduate attributes and so on. Um, variation to traditional at output, which I, I, I've mentioned before about outputs like portfolios and so on. Um, and the shift to include student outcomes as well as research outcomes. Now, uh, what I mean by that is that at the moment, or just go for the traditional PhD, the only thing that is judged is the thesis, really. You know, at the end of the day, that's the only thing that's judged. And there's no way you can judge some of the other outcomes that are uh, aspired to in doctoral education and which are clearly um, articulated in a, in a range of, of, of policy documents and so on. And, you know, it's to do with um, uh, leadership and communication, um, uh, entrepreneurship, public policy, intellectual property, all those kinds of things that people aspire to, to get through, her, through a doctoral education um, uh, are just simply not, are not measured. But a, a desire of doctoral education, of professional doctoral education, was to measure those kinds of things. And the issue is to what extent can you measure it through a thesis and through a research project if that's the only proper external exam. Uh, and then, and then there's a change or a shift in what you think of as the, as the, the student, um, the move from the academic scholar to the professional worker researcher. You know? What is that, that new subject of, of education? Um, everyone knows or did know what the academic scholar, was, but scholar is, uh, but the professional worker researcher is a, a new kind of identity and so there's a kind of a lot of work around the identity of the worker um, researcher. But a, a couple of things I want to say about this. Now, you can, one one way to see a professional doctorate as a kind of a wedge to change doctoral education more broadly, and a lot of these points you can now see are in doctoral education more broadly. So. If you, if you take the PhD, the PhD has changed dramatically since the, you know, the last 20 years. So um, they're more, they're, they're, the um, students are different. Um, there's a much more move to have cohort entries or to at least get people working together in groups. Um, there's much more structure to a PhD. I mean, when I did my PhD, I was just, it was just purely the uh, apprenticeship model. I mean, I could give a seminar if I wanted to, didn't have to. Uh, I didn't have to do anything. No progress reports, nothing. Um, so uh, Dan's laughing there. Well, that, that were the good old days. So, <laughs> so I mean, I mean, in some way, something. May, there's something. You know, it's good and bad. I mean, the structuring of it, I think, has been a good thing. But it's also in response to the corporatization of universities, the corporatization, you know, the idea of key performance indicators. You know, you progress after six months and you reach a stage, then you go to the next next stage, and so on. Um, it's just so different from the autonomous scholar working independently on their creative output. Um, it's just so it, it's completely changed. So, so I see partly the professional doctorate as actually. Not that distinguishable. I think the PhD is a much more flexible instrument now. 
Okay, so um, not as flexible as it as it could be, um, but it, it's taken on a lot of these aspirations, if you like. So you can sort of I see the professional doctorate as a kind of a um, uh, what's the word a fifth column coming into higher education and changing what's already there, and because it changes the thinking a bit, you know, um, and so it's had an impact, I think, on broadly speaking, on doctoral education. However, there are some constraints, and the constraints have, have held back innovation, I think, in um, professional doctorates. And one, con one constraint has to do with the, st the strategic positioning of the professional doctorate within the higher education sector. And the strategic positioning is universities, by and large, have said their professional doctorates are research degrees you know, nominated as research degrees under the um, uh, higher education um, system. And that means that it has implications for funding, it has implica implications for funding for the, um, the uh, RTP, the research training program, because a graduate with a doctoral degree gets money into the research training program and it enhances the university's research reputation. So universities really want to have their professional doctorates regarded as research degrees. And um, if, if they are research degrees, that means it has to comply with a couple of things. One is at least two-thirds research work. Okay, so you're limited to how much coursework you can have. It has to be two-thirds research. And, and that's just done by manipulating credit points, you know, like you can, you, know, you can say we're going to have six or eight, um, eight um, uh, pieces of coursework, eight subjects. Uh, we better make sure the, the credit points don't add up to more than a third. That's all. That's, that's how, how people do it. But um, so it has to meet, meet the RTP guidelines, two-thirds research, and the uh, Australian Qualification Framework description for a doctoral degree, which um, has those concepts of originality, um, which is come back to later. So it's, it's about original, originality and a contribution to knowledge. So they're the, 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 two, the, the two key elements. So those are really the constraints on innovation in, in um, a professional doctorate, uh, uh, professional doctorates in the uh, universities. I was going to say something else there. Um, to knowledge. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, when you when you look up, so I just want to take up briefly. I, I mean, I don't know if people want to make a comment at this point and, and start a discussion, or whether I just go through these and have a discussion. But just if you feel compelled, or if you'd like to say something, just say it. I can manage that. I mean, you, we could talk about this for two hours, you know. So, but um, the best way I could come up with the concept of originality is, is to, to look through various definitions, and I just made up this list. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And, and I was trying to think, where, where does professional doctorates fit in with this notion of originality? And um, probably, um, I, don't think, I don't think the testing, I don't think testing someone else's ideas is really what it's about. Um, that's a fairly traditional concept of the relationship between theory and practice, or empirical work and practice. Um, probably making a synthesis that hasn't been made before, which means you bring a different framework to bear upon some issue. Um, uh, using already known material, but with a new interpretation. You know, that can always be, that can always be done. I mean, I, I always think in psychology that's like when psychoanalysis began, suddenly, you know, dreams, you know. Well, here's a new interpretation of dreams. Uh, where you go. Um, taking a particular technique and applying it in another area. Um, that's, I mean, I've got examples of all these, actually, but, um, you know, one thing I've got here is game theory applied to conflict and cooperation is one example of that. Um, a lot of these, a lot of the examples you can think of come from normal science. Um, uh, bringing new evidence to bear on an old issue. Um, so that might be, uh, 
you know, the role of neuro neuroscience in the nature-nurture controversy or something like that, or the role of neuroscience, you know, people are talking about neuroscience and education a lot these days and so on. So, it, you know, whenever there's new information, especially in a place like, in a field like education, um, you, you can, there's so many different areas you can draw on and, you know, uh, you can bring new evidence to bear on an old issue um, or carrying out empirical work that hasn't been done before. That's probably where most professional doctorates sort of come in, new empirical work, because um, people, you know, it might be the case studies, for example, of your own work. Um, it might be an analysis of your own work and your particular circumstances of your work and so on. So, but either way, the concept of originality within our system has to be there. And examiners always look for that. You know, that's the kind of the gold standard of, of a research degree, originality, contribution to knowledge. So when you're doing a, a professional doctorate, you have to think about what is my contribution to knowledge, what is my, what's original about what I'm, what I'm doing, and where is the strength of my thesis? Uh, and then more about that later. OK, now some possibilities. <coughs> Um, I think there's a lot more possibility in EDDs in particular for non-traditional research outputs. Um, and the Doctor of Creative Arts model, I don't think, I mean, you can correct me if it's, I, I haven't found any thesis, professional doctorate, that's used the Doctor of Creative Arts model. The Doctor of Creative Arts model is, say you're a, a writer, so you, you write a book, but then you do an exegesis, and the exegesis is a, is a, explanation of the book and what you do in the exegesis it might be literary criticism um, but or it might it, you know it's, it's something to do with with you know th theories relating to literature so you 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 analyze the historical um, social philosophical background if you like to why what the book is about how it's how it's dealt with and you can see that in literary criticism I, I'm just reading again um, is it Kurtz's book, Disgrace? And um, there's a whole lot of, in Kurtz's book, Disgrace, for those of you who are familiar with it, there's a whole lot of literary criticism on it. And it's very, very dense kind of criticism, you know, looking at, looking at, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, it, you know, the layers, the layers in that, in that book and so on. So familiar, for people who are familiar at all with literary criticism, you know, or, or just criti critique, an analysis of um, uh, artifacts like a book, then you know there's there's a lot to write about apart from the book itself. You know? And then, and I think that's a good model for education, especially practitioners in education. And if you look at, I, I think the best. I'm looking. I'm trying to think of good examples of how you, of this. And I think the best examples are the old ALTC and OLT grants. The, the um, Australian Learning and Teaching Council funded a whole lot of research in, in, um, amongst teachers in higher ed to improve teaching. And then that was followed by the Office of Learning and Teaching, which then funded a whole lot of grants. And that was followed by nothing. But for, 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 <coughs> for a number of years, these grants were regarded as um, category one on the research on era on the on the research data collection process, they were ca categorised as category one, and they were practitioner research projects. All of them. Um, some people might have had some, and essentially they were practitioner research projects. So if you want a good example of practitioner research projects, I think you know troll through a few a few of um, of, of of those, and you you you, you get a, a, a good idea. Um, and I've I've done since I was since I've left since I've been an emeritus professor. I've been an evaluator on a lot of those projects from 2010 through to about when they finished in about 2016, 15, something like that. I, I evaluated about eight of those projects and they were all really good you know, examples of practitioner um, research. And what they, what they, what those, they particularly did, and this is the, the issue you've got to face, there had to be they had to have theory. So the issue for a knowledge worker or a practitioner researcher is how to go beyond their practice and produce knowledge that is publicly worthwhile, or at least 
worthwhile knowledge within the profession that can be shared. So it's no good just doing an idiosyncratic piece of work which just examines your history as a teacher or your, your history in education or something like that. Um, you have to find a way to go beyond your experiences and link it to something more broad. Now, there are various ways people have done that. Some people do it through high theory or theoretical concepts, or they, and so they adopt theory as a, a lens through which to view their work. They can do it that way. Um, sometimes they adopt a critique of theory to say which, which theoretical position best explains these circumstances. But some people don't bother too much with theory, but rather they, they try to develop frameworks. And that's this typical of ALT, OLT grants, and they're quite good. I mean, they're frameworks, or models, if you like, which help to give some kind of understanding um, of your practice, which can be communicated to others in a way that um, makes them understand their practice, rather than just a reiteration of, oh, I did this, what did you do? You know, like, it's, you know. So, <clears throat> um, and, you know, I, I supervised a few theses like this, and one, one person, um, you'll know this person, um, Jeff, uh, what came to me, and I was very worried about this person because um, two of her previous supervisors had died on her, you know? So I was number three. <laughs> <coughs> and so, but I don't think it was anything to do with her, but she did, but um, she was a person that worked in the area of simulations and games, and she wanted to do an autobiography, right? And the first thing I said to her is, look, I, I read what she'd done, and I said, the first thing you've got to learn about autobiography, it's not about you. Right? And so sort of, in the end, she did really quite a good, a good piece of research. But that's the message. you know, An autobiography isn't about you. It's about your experiences and how they relate to others and how you can say something more general and useful in a public way. So you've got to get away from yourself, so to speak, in it. Um, and um, there are other frameworks you can use. Some people use policy frameworks to analyze their, their work, so they bounce off, off policy. Um, uh, some people just use data. They just use the, the um, other research that's been done that's not highly theoretical, but it, it produces data. So you relate your research to the data. Sometimes people just pick up issues. Here are the issues, you know? Um, and so, um, so basically what I'm saying is there are a whole lot of non-traditional research outputs, including portfolios and so on, that I think we still need to experiment with in, in doctoral, uh, professional doctorates. One of the problems, one of the I've talked about the constraint of, of, of it being a research degree. But the other constraint that I did mean to mention that I'd forgotten about was the examination process, right? So the gold standard, as we all know, for the examination process is two external examiners, right? So you have to have two external examiners. Right? The problem with ex external examiners is that they have their own view of what constitutes a thesis. So, um, so there's a kind of a, a, an education of examiners as well in this. So it's a risky enterprise. And um, the only way you can actually educate uh, examiners is to have a separate description of what you want them to examine. You know, say, this is what is required, this is what we want you to look at. The problem with a lot of examiners is they don't read that. They just have in their brain what a thesis is. And they read this, they think, well, you know. So, um, <clears throat> and in that risky process, we've had, we had that quite a bit, but I was dean of the university graduate school for eight, nine years, and I always said, well, we're the examiners. There are external examiners, but we are ultimately the examiners. So if there's evidence that they haven't followed the, what we've asked them to do, then that goes into our consideration of how seriously we take their, their examination. So, um, so you can work your way through it, but it is, it is a, a risky thing to depart from you know, what is internationally a kind of a, a concept of what a, what a thesis entails, especially if you're trying to push the boundaries of that a bit. Um, but, you know, there, uh, so I, uh, and there, is it another, another thing that, um, that people with work experience bring to um, a thesis, and this is something I've used for quite some time, 
you know, um, even in your, you know, say you do a literature review, right? A normal literature review will look at the, um, uh, will be a kind of a theoretical critique, you know? Are the concepts clear? Um, are they mutually exclusive? Are they exhaustive? Do they take into account all the phenomena under observation and so on? Um, and then you do an empirical critique. You say, well, <clears throat> they've got some evidence here, but how was the evidence gathered? You know, was it a questionnaire? Did they ask the right questions? Did they sample the right people? So that's le another level of critique. Now, that is classic, old-fashioned, I mean, but you know, valuable areas of critique. But there are also further areas of critique that people with experience can add. And one of them is that what's like what I call a practical critique. What are the practices promoted by the particular theory or being proposed, and are they successful? Um, so it's analysis of, you know, what, what are the likely outcomes? What are the consequences what, you know, of this particular theory? <clears throat> and then there's what I might call probably an ideological critique, which what, what are the ideas promoted by this theory? And are those, you know, how do those fit into social and historical um, situations to current value systems and so on, you know? So, and I think the, the practical and ideological critique can be brought to bear a lot by people who've had a lot of experience in work, but certainly the practical critique, um, but also aware of, you know, that, that, you know, research of various kinds produces um, consequences and, and ideas. And, and an example, and this is going way back to my early years doing psychology at Macquarie Uni, there was a, in, a, in psychology, there was a person called, um, uh, academic called Hans Eysenck. I don't know if anyone is familiar with Hans Eysenck, but anyway, Hans Eysenck wrote a book called Race and IQ. And, um, and when he came out to Australia, he was um, roundly, you know, there were protests because he was giving a paper and so on. And that's mainly practical and ideological critique of his work, you know. Of course, there was also a critique of his actual empirical work as well. There was that went on. But it clearly had an ideological and practical implication, you know. And what people thought was the practical implication was that, oh, you know, intelligence is basically inherited. Um, if the African Americans have a lower intelligence than, than um, white Americans, we really can't, education can't do much about it, right? So that's one narrative. And, and, it, and another ideological narrative has to do with the title of it, Race and IQ. Why is it called Race and IQ? Because he kept on saying it's not Race and IQ and so on. So it just, it's just that all research has these implications. You know, what are the practical implications? What, what values does it promote um, in society? So that's a, um, a useful thing. And I just wanted, oh, um, now the next one, a different kind of relationship between theory and practice, I'm kind of, that's really the wrong question. I think the, the question is what I said before, is that find a way of going beyond your, ex, your immediate experience and find, even if it's just a, 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 um, uh, a framework. For example, if you take something like leadership in education, um, you know, you, you've got different people doing different things in leadership, and, um, and, but they all have frameworks. Jeff Scott did a, um, uh, looked at leadership in Australian higher ed um, in his, one of his ALTC grants. And, but his was very much an old fashioned view of leadership. A leadership as the, what I'd call, he didn't use this term, but I do, a heroic leader, you know? Which has been, most people have moved away from the idea of the, the heroic leader, even though we've got in some ways some certainly populist heroic leaders in the world today. But, um, uh, and, but he, would, he would very much talk about the qualities of the leader, you know? What qualities do you have in a leader? They're, they're personal, they're interpersonal, they're cognitive, they're role-specific, they're generic, you know? And that, but that's his framework. And that's enough to get the debate running and the, get the debate going. Another ALTC grant I did um, that evaluated was by uh, Sandra Jones from uh, RMIT, I think, and she did a distributed leadership model. So she used all that kind of um, model. Um, Jeff and Alan Walker have written something, uh, you've written quite a bit about leadership, but in, in one of his um, articles, I think, correct me, Jeff, um, if I've got it wrong, you basically look at, what? <laughs> yeah, 
No, it's, well, well I'm, I'm just illustrating you can develop, you've got it, you don't just talk about, you know, it, you've got to have, have some kind of framework. And what you did in the article you did with Alan Walker, I think, is you, you, um, you said, okay, we've looked at the literature, and so here are some propositions from the literature, and the propositions are things like leadership can only be understood in context. That's one of the propositions, for example. You know, there, were, there are others. But that was the structure you used to write the paper. And that gave it, that gives it a, a public, you know, that allows it, you to go beyond just saying things about leadership because you're saying it, you're providing a, a, um, a framework. And, and that's not so, what you did is not so far away from another approach to leadership, which is practice theory. So if you look at Stephen Chemis, and this is high theory. Practice theory is kind of un unnecessarily obscure, I think, but, you know, it's, it's quite okay. But, and, and, and practice theory is about, it's an approach to looking at leadership in schools, which just has a different flavour to it. Um, so you talk about practice architectures. But when, when he talks about practice architectures, when it comes down to it, it's basically, well, I'm, being, I'm simplifying, it's context. That's what it is. It's the practice architectures, everything, everything that's going on in the, in, it, that surrounds the practice is the practice architecture. So you, you look at the practice architecture as well. So, you know, what I'm saying is that you've, as you, professional doctorates, the message, if you like, it, it, they're just not about um, endorsing your own practices. It's about linking your practices and for writing a framework for talking about your practices, whether the framework is high theoretical or just a framework of some kind or, or, or issues of some kind. And then the final thing is um, a new type of reasoning, and that brings me back to the opening. Um, I think I've got a, oh yes. <clears throat> I must confess, when I saw the title, abductive reasoning, I didn't know what it meant, which I shouldn't have known what it means. Do other people know, are familiar with abductive reasoning? But anyway. I had to look it up, I must confess. So we know about deductive reasoning. You know, you have a general rule, leads to a prediction, and then you work out, you know, you, it, the thing about deductive reasoning, it leads to a prediction, and you can test whether it's true or not, whether the general rule is true or not. So, you know, relativity theory, as we know, you know, every now and again, it's, it's a good theory because it's falsifiable. A good theory is always one that's falsifiable. So um, it's falsifiable by making observations contrary to what you'd predict. So when you get the red shift when close to the sun, ah, that, that's another confirmation of relativity, so on. Then you get inductive reasoning, which is what we do in the social sciences a, a lot. Um, we do a whole lot of empirical work and we get probabilistic outcomes always from empirical work, but the, the, you know, and, and we have probability levels that we're happy with, so we're happy to say that's, that's true. May not be true, but you know, it's, I mean, that's how, I, how our judicial system works as well, you know, that it's probabilistic. Um, so, and then, but abductive reasoning is, is about incomplete observations and best predictions. That's the thing about abductive reasoning. And what it is, it's, 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 it's sort of, it's really how people work in everyday life that you, have, you don't have complete knowledge, you can't make all the observations, you can't have all the data, but you've got to act in the world one way or another. And um, I did some, res well, some reading and research and writing on, on practical intelligence and expertise. And that literature came out in the 80s and 90s um, originally. And, um, and that was the point they were making, is about abductive, abductive reasoning is the reasoning of the practitioner because you're, 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 you have to act in the world. And it made me think, you know, with, with practical intelligence, the whole idea of practical intelligence is that, you know, you can't do a pencil and paper test, but you can sure do the maths when it comes to racetrack handicapping, you know, or something like that. You can do it really quickly in your brain, but you'd fail a, you know, a paper and pencil test. Or with expertise, um, you know, medical researchers, uh, <clears throat> if you're a neophyte, not, not a medical, if you're a neophyte medical practitioner, you use a lot of deductive reasoning, you know? Um, so you try to eliminate all the possibilities, you know? Or 
sort of deductive reasoning, but anyway, eliminating all the possibilities. So you keep all the possibilities in mind until they're systematically eliminated. But people who have expertise who are medical practitioners don't do that at all. They, they kind of look at you and think, oh, you've got this wrong. You know, like there's a kind of an intuitive, it almost comes to an intuitive level. You know, but that, I think that's what's meant by abductive reasoning. So I look forward to reading that paper on abductive reasoning because I'm not sure exactly how it builds in, but nevertheless, um, I think it's certainly a way of um, a way of, of, of uh, a way into doing research in a professional doctorate and a way of researching um, uh, uh, as a knowledge. Well, you know as a knowledge worker, if you like, uh, as a researching practice. So <clears throat> that's, that's all I have to say. So if, <laughs> questions? Um, <clears throat> well, um, I also mentioned some other, like, I, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the E-Grad School. It was something developed by the Australian Technology Network of Universities. And the E-Grad School has, um, a whole, has a curriculum for the development of desired generic attributes for people doing doctorates, not just professional doctorates. And I think I mentioned some of these things. Um, project management, uh, entrepreneurship. Um, uh, researching practice is one of their modules, actually, researching practice. But unfortunately, the researching practice in their modules is only in the arts and design area. It's not in education. Which, you know. And then um, intellectual property, commercialization of research, all those kinds of things. Are the, that's the curriculum they have identified. And the other way to identify a curriculum is to look at the graduate attributes, you know? So even the AQF has specified quite clearly what um, the, grad, the sort of the graduate out outcomes, anyway, for level 10, which is the same, you know, this is level 10 qualification. So out of all the levels, this is the highest, you know? PhD and professional doctorates are the highest. And their graduate attributes there. Some different universities have had specified different graduate attributes. Interestingly enough, most, when you look at most of the graduate attributes, they're the classic attributes of what we call um, the um, knowledge worker, you know, the contemporary worker. Um, flexibility, creativity, communication, teamwork, entrepreneurship, you know, all those kinds of things come out in graduate attributes. So sort of there's your curriculum. That's, you know. Oh, I've got Dan or, or Elke. Just yeah. a clarification question. At UBS, yeah. you were saying you provide examiners with a different set of uh, criteria? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we did. Yeah. yeah, that's true. I think that's necessary. If it's going to be different, it's necessary. I totally yeah. agree with you. I, just, yeah. I find myself, um, so first of all, thank yeah. you for this insight. Yeah. I didn't know much about the question back to that. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm in a situation where I'm actually examining such a thesis. Yes. Oh, your yeah, instructions, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, good on you, Elke, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Does it, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I, I think if you... It seems that it's, it's not... Yeah. Not that different. Is that what you're but saying? It's not a bad institution. No. Which, um, well, I think the thing is... the. When you're developing these, if you don't have them here, I don't think you do have the separate ones here at the exactly. moment. We're one of yeah. the universities that has exactly the same yeah. um, examiner's uh, requirements yeah. as for the MDs, for the PhD, and it's already caused some problems that Rob can speak about at length because one of his jobs is... No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, 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 I mean, so, sorry to interrupt you, but one of the outcomes of today is I wanted to start a conversation with Rob and the faculty about this because we have approximately 16 people currently enrolled in an MD in our faculty. And I think as a matter of urgency, we need to work with the university and those 16 people to be very, very clear about what the assessment criteria and instructions would be to your examiners. Otherwise, people could be acting in good faith and not a certain Hmm. What they're doing. And we can end up, it'll end up in tears as it did at the end of last yeah. year for another MD student that did not. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's about what um, you need to have in those guidelines, what's an acceptable output from the yeah. university's point of view. Um, because that's the, the point of difference more than any, and it becomes developing those guidelines is not just a bureaucratic exercise, it's a real it's an conceptual exercise that's quite important. Dan. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. One of the bullets that you touched on was the cohort. Yes. Cohort model. And uh, if, I would enjoy you going into a little more detail of, of the strengths and limitations of the cohort. Are you having related thoughts? Are, are you aware of any models in Europe, States, Australia that are? Also related to this is um, the how how does a program at the university level help prepare supervisors and program delivery to properly manage and get the most out of the football? Hmm. Do you know the answer to these questions, <laughs> Dan? <laughs> I suspect you do. <laughs> yeah, well, same here. But well, I think. Uh, you know, you can think of the ideal cohort, you know, would be people um, working on quite similar, I, I see the cohort mainly, that's certainly the way it worked out in our institution, the cohort mainly is a support group. Um, uh, it, it Very rarely were people working on the same problem, you know, like, you know, that's another model which I think would be great, is where, in a sense, you, you as a supervisor, um, or several supervisors, or you have, you have a, a kind of research agenda, and it's broad enough to allow people to contribute in different ways to that research agenda, but it's similar enough for people to work in a cohort way and bounce off each other. So that's the, the ideal way. The way it worked out in practice is people did their own thing, and they'd presented to each other, and people critiqued each other, and supervisors were present, and it was more of a support network, um, but there were also cohorts in doing subjects as well, you know. So um, that way they could talk about each other's work practices and so on. And um, uh, sometimes the cohorts helped develop the problem to be, you know, people don't come with identified problems to be researched, you know. 
Um, so it's really, it's a way of exchanging ideas as everyone sort of goes forward and people support each other. That's the, that's the ideal, you know. But the ideal breaks down, especially when you get a whole lot of people who might be remotely, <laughs> remote from the institution, you know. Um, that's, that can be a problem, yeah. So I didn't answer your thing fully, but anyway, I got there partly. <laughs> Yeah. 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 The, the funny thing is, in, in the sciences, you get much more cohort work, you know. People have a large research agenda. They've got four or five, you know, I'm talking about supervisors with four or five students, all working on something quite similar. And um, uh, it's sort of under the direction. It's almost like the supervisor becomes the, um, the director of the research, you know. Yeah. 28. Yeah. I don't really need this sitting so close. So yes, sorry, just, um, that's all right. You've made, thank you very much for your, your presentation it's a today. Yeah. I think it's, it's very timely in terms of the work that we're doing yeah. here on, on cohort models as well. But you, you made the point that universities are the examiners of, of these mm. uh, models, obviously yeah. with, you know, mm. in conjunction with, with, with external uh, examiners. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what you see as some opportunities to rethink the examination model. because. To Jeff's point, this is where mm. this is where the tears come from. Yeah. Uh, often in that, and it's not just around um, communicating clearly to examiners, but it's difficult to get examiners. It's mm. difficult. You often have great variability in, in examination reports. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about what you see as some possible future models around the examination process. <sighs> well, I think for the time being. You're stuck with the idea of having, that's the thing, if it's a research degree, you can, you can rebrand it as not a research degree, it's still a doctorate, that's one option, but if it's a research degree and it's funded as a research degree, you really have no option but to have two external examiners. So your only option then is to position the examiners slightly differently to the way they might position themselves. So. Um, it's a bit, the, the model of a two external examiners is the same as the model for um, refereeing um, articles for publication in journals, you know? The idea that you get two independent people from outside and, and so on. Um, and, um, but you can position differently. Some examiners really believe they are the examiner, and if that thesis is passed or that article is published and I've said no, you know, a complaint was going to go through, right? So that's. That's one position the examiner can take. Another positioning of the examiner, the one that I prefer, is that the examiner is making a whole range of comments about this thesis. Um, you probably don't have to have passed or not passed. You could probably just say, you still have the two external examiners, but you say, we want your comments. We don't want you to do an overall evaluation, but we want your critique of this, this, this. And that actually puts more pressure on examiners because some examiners are very weak in their comments, but they're very big with their tick, no. <laughs> so it, this, this, this way, what you then do is you assess their comments in the light of what you expect, in the light of, of what the supervisor has said. to this. Like, for example, if a supervisor has endorsed a particular empirical method that the examiner says that's hopeless, um, you know, you've got to work your way through that. So that's, that's, that's the only suggestion I can make is that get them not, or, or to say to them, look, we have an internal examination process, which you do, because that's what all universities do, but uh, just, like, just like journals do too. I mean, journals publish things that don't, that, that don't get through first up, you know, and that, that some people aren't happy with the changes, so it goes to somebody else, you know, and so on. So it's the same sort of process, but it's a process of, always a process of negotiation, but it, how you position the examiners is quite important. And uh, maybe, and, and I only just thought of that then in response to your question, don't get them to say, you know, pass with minor, you know, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the standard, but really it's not, doesn't necessarily have to be the standard. Yeah. And I wonder in that process is, is an opportunity to actually grow your own examiners, um, and I don't mean that from within the university, yeah. but to, to actually see, I mean, locating examiners is incredibly difficult, but mm. to sort of, I know some journals do provide a sort of, if you like, a paid review service, the, the journal, um, you know, 
professional yeah, examiners. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there an opportunity there to look at professional examiners that still have a credibility and independence? Yeah. Well, I, not, one thing I still do, I'm, I'm on, I'm a, a, a reader or what do they call me, um, an edit, I, I forget the, the professional title, but I'm down, I'm listed in the, in a couple of journals yeah. as one of the people, a consulting editor, yeah. yeah. So they don't generally go beyond their consulting editors, you know. So, but the list is quite long. So the list might be there might be forty or fifty people as a consulting editor, and I'm on two journals like that at the moment as a consulting editor, and I get a few each year. The problem with a, a, a large thesis compared to an article is it involves a lot of work, um, and the pay is you know I mean you hardly it's it's something you don't do it for the money you do it for you know, professional engagement, but there's a possibility to get a, a rain, a rain, I, yeah, I think that's possible, um, and to formally appoint these people as examiners, and, and they, that, that's, I mean, I'm just trying to think of their motivation, that could be part of their, you know, professional engagement, you know, I am a, an examiner of PhDs at the, you know, I, you know, and there's a possibility, pay, yeah. Pay well, maybe, maybe, yeah. It's, it's, I think that's a possibility. Um, it could be open to, yeah, but because, cause, because journals do it, and that's the model, I think you could, probably could do it. Yep. Yeah. And you'd probably go beyond them every now and again yes. as well. Yeah. Sorry, I haven't had We We sort of have, but we yeah. We sort of have, but, yeah. if, um, but some people have to go, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, but if we've got one... Um, you talked about um, two examiners. Yes. Yeah. Are you referring to specifically the educational doctorates or... Um, all doctorates. Research yeah, all research degrees, including master's by research. Because here it's been for the past five years, it's been it's three, been three external examples. Oh, three, well, that, well, two is the minimum, yeah. We're not relying on some internal review. We don't trust our staff. Yeah, yeah. Really well, yeah. well that's, that's where we differ from North America, of course, yeah. I examined, I examined a thesis in um, North America just last year, and we, she did her final um, defence, um, an oral defence, yeah, and um, we were all her supervisors. <laughs> so, and that's that's something we're not familiar with here, but uh, yeah, we 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 were her supervisors, so it, that felt a little bit funny to me, um, but it worked, you know. No, but, but yeah, yeah. Yep. Effort, yeah. Two yeah. 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 It is. Well, I, what what I meant by two is that in our system, okay. two ex, two external is the minimum, yeah. um, and sometimes you go beyond that for insurance reasons. You know, just in you know, like it, sometimes it's good to have three to get different perspectives. Okay. Thank you. Call it to an end. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going yeah. to call this to an end. Uh, man, Oh, okay. Not because of any lack of interest, because I've got a few questions too, but we'll, have, we'll continue the discussion if you want to stay outside. But I'd like to thank on your behalf and for me personally. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge the thoroughness with which you prepared with this, because we discussed, I, I discussed mm. what we were doing here, and Mark spent a considerable amount of time reading and preparing for today, so it's not just coming away from home for 36 hours. Uh, it's all the, the, the week or so work and thinking you put into it. It's very generous of you. We appreciate it and thanks everyone for thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank you. again. Thank you.